Hi, my name is Jason Lavilio. I'm chair of the Media and Communication Studies Department at UMBC. And today we're talking with Professor Rebecca Edelman, assistant professor in the Department of Media and Communication Studies. Professor Edelman has written a wonderful book called Beyond the Checkpoint, Visual Practices in America's Global War on Terror, published this year by the University of Massachusetts Press. And uh, I suspect it's going to be a book that a lot of people are going to be talking about uh, precisely because the topics of uh, terrorism and media representations of terrorism have become such uh, important topics in our political and cultural discourse. Rebecca, I learned a lot reading uh, your book. And uh, one of the things that was most striking to me was that traditionally when we think of visual culture studies, we tend to think of scholarship that an analyzes representations of specific categories of identity, or we tend to think in terms of the studies of the gaze, the sort of psychoanalytic uh, construct about how uh, subjects are trained to look. Um, beyond the checkpoint, your book really uh, represents a significant departure from th these two methods. Could you talk a little bit about how you sort of move beyond the traditional uh, approaches of visual culture studies in this study? Sure. Um, so the two approaches that you mentioned to studying the visual are important and they've been profoundly influential and they were influential in my training and in my research as I was writing the book. Um, but as I started researching this material, I realized that I wanted and I needed to do something different. One of the challenges with studying something like terrorism is that we know from much of this valuable research that um, extreme phenomena like terrorism or war or that kind of militarized violence uh, tend to be very difficult to represent. Right? And we all know this sort of intuitively that when we talk about or if we think of even traumatic experiences in our own lives, it can be very difficult for us to um, represent them coherently or completely. And yet these are precisely the kinds of experiences that we want to represent, that we want to communicate. So what I tried to do in the book is think about a different method uh, for for interpreting or for analyzing the visual culture of terrorism. So rather than analyzing specific representations like reading films or photographs or things like that, what I looked at instead is what I call visual practices, which are the various ways that individuals and institutions put um, both specific visual artifacts and indeed the visual, the visual itself um, to use to achieve a variety of, um, of objectives, of wartime objectives. What's so fascinating about that approach is that you uh, do something which in retrospect seems uh, obvious, but which isn't done very often, which is you acknowledge that producers of images and viewers of images are thinking quite a bit about the power of those images rather than leaving all of the interpretive power to the scholar uh, who sort of finds, uh, finds meaning where others might have overlooked it. Uh, your approach actually um, begins in the assumption that all of the uh, creative people, uh, regulatory people, and subjects of, of the visual uh, culture objects are deeply engaged in the meanings of these things. Yes, and I think that um, one of the challenges that I found uh, in the extant scholarship on this is that um, it tends to assume a couple of things that I think actually aren't true. Um, one of the kind of prevailing assumptions in scholarship of the visual and popular culture of the war on terror is that it's all designed to just kind of make us um, docile or acqui acquiescent, right? That all of this is basically just propaganda um, to encourage us to support a war effort or to scare us into compliance, um, to scare us into giving up civil liberties, that sort of thing. Um, and in fact, I think that's actually not the case. I think if we if we look at, um, as I try to do in the book, if we actually look at the ways that images are being produced and circulated and consumed, we find out that the, um, the picture is much more complicated. Um, so typically we imagine the relationship between things like the government and the media during wartime um, in pretty binary ways. We often think of it either as a relationship of censorship, right, where the, the um, government is basically telling the media what they can't say, or we think of it in terms of propaganda, where the government is sort of using the media, for example, to promote a particular vision of the war. Certainly both both of those things are happening, um, but that's not 
anywhere near the whole story. And so what I try to do in the book is to provide a fuller, um, more comprehensive picture of the visual culture of the war on terror to look at institutions beyond um, the typical ones like you know, mainstream media to think about all the different um, organizations that are actually involved in policing and, and regulating this visual culture and creating it for that matter. I found on this topic, I found the most challenging a piece uh, for me mm -hmm. was uh, in the first chapter where you focus on illuminating practices mm -hmm. in a uh, visual culture, uh, where you, you focus precisely on this point, which is that critics of America's foreign policy in the last decade or so have sought to reveal the um, sometimes very upsetting uh, visual evidence of how we are prosecuting the global war on terror worldwide. And as someone who has been critical uh, often of uh, the administrations uh, that have prosecuted this war over the last uh, decade and more, um, it, was a, it was sort of a bracing critique to read your analysis of the ways in which simply illuminating pictures, say, of uh, prisoners in Abu Ghraib prison being humiliated uh, was not in itself a problem-free move uh, on, the, on behalf of those who would like to uh, hold accountable the United States government and the United States military. Talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, the chapter one, as you mentioned, has its origins for me um, in a piece of mail I received um, back in probably 2006 or 2007. Um, I was invited, I got some kind of form invitation to an anti-war poetry reading. And the, the, it, it had all the information about like where and who and what, um, but fully half the page was occupied by this reproduction of one of um, the most famous images from Abu Ghraib of the hooded prisoner on top of the box of MREs with um, his, you know, his arms outstretched and the wires hanging from his hands. And I received this invitation and it troubled me in a way that at the time I couldn't name. Mm. I didn't know what to do with it. I kept like throwing it and recycling and taking it back out. Um, in the event, I actually wrote a strongly worded letter to the organizers of this poetry um, reading. They never responded. Um, so they didn't respond, so I decided I was gonna write a book about it. <laughs> um, and in this first chapter, um, I, I try actually to critique um, many of the positions that I actually am quite sympathetic to, right? These kind of anti-war, anti-torture um, platforms. And I argue that in fact, um, they're profoundly problematic because of how they work with images and how they uncritically reproduce the images. Um, particularly, I talk extensively about um, the way that academics reproduce these images. Um, I read a lot about this. There's tons of scholarship about it, as you, as you mentioned before. And what I was finding in the things that I was reading was um, the same dozen or so very spectacular images of torture being um, reproduced sort of uncritically without anybody saying, like, it might be a problem for me to be relying on these images or for me to be recirculating them. Um, we tend to assume, um, I think, because we talk about, you know, the torture, the argument that like the torture shouldn't be undertaken in our names, right, or the torture was financed by our tax dollars, um, we tend to assume that that means we own the images. Mm -hmm. And in the book, I argue otherwise. I argue that, um, in fact, the people that have the most claim to the images are precisely those people that can't exercise them. And I argue that it's the detainees who are being pictured within them who ought to have control over the pictures, and they don't have it. So given that, I'm really interested in how we might think about um, kind of visual ethics uh, when we sort of step into these visual cultures that are so overdetermined by violence um, and these and these problematic histories. And um, that that's that, that's um, that, that's very much to the point. Um, I, I was I was struggling with that, and I think you you make a very difficult. You make a, an argument that's very difficult to challenge from this uh, traditional notion of the power of illumination. Mm -hmm. Uh, to to bring clarity and to bring justice. And I think we, in this culture, tend to have uh, an enormous uh, amount of faith in the visual, um, going back to the Enlightenment and the notion of bringing light to is seen as bringing wisdom to and chasing out various kinds of scarless forms 
of oppression, and it even goes back to the ancient Greeks and Apollonian notions of light and, and reason. Um, are there implications in this critique that you make, which is really quite tightly focused uh, on, on the very specific local cases that you look at within, within recent history, but are there larger implications for how we think of um, visuality as a, uh, a technology of truth and visuality and light and uh, tearing away uh, coverings to reveal as a, uh, as a kind of a, a moral good or a, a sort of a, a measure of progress or as a necessary tool in the pursuit of justice. Uh, are, there, are there larger implications for that whole kind of Western approach to, to knowing? Sure, I mean, I think so. Um, so one of the challenges in making this argument or in dealing with these kinds of images is that I, I fully confess that there are no perfect solutions, right? Because especially when we're talking about images of torture or images that are created with the intention of doing harm to someone, um, I believe that we can't just excuse those histories, right? Or we can't, um, that we can never have good intentions sufficient enough to change that past. Um, so whenever we try to engage those images, we're entered into that visual economy. So we're only ever going to have imperfect solutions. Um, and so given that, um, we might still have to act, right? Or we might still have an agenda, or we might still have a, um, a political position to make. So how can we do that in, least, in less harmful ways? Um, so that's, I think that's part of it. Um, but I also think that um, at a certain point, because we've all seen these pictures, for example, from Abu Ghraib, because, because we've all seen them, because they are recirculated so, heaven, so heavily, um, at a certain point, we're sort of beyond their usefulness. Um, surely at the beginning, um, there was a time when they may have served a purpose, an important documentary purpose to get people to realize that there was this kind of abuse happening and that it did matter. Um, but now that we all know that, Right, and that now that so many people um, are kind of of the opinion that that was wrong, I don't know that there's still a need to to recirculate and reproduce the pictures. I think when we do that, we're actually saying something more about ourselves, right, rather than advocating on behalf of the prisoners. Um, elsewhere, I do write, um, I have some, I've published some critiques of the idea of transparency. Um, I argue that it is flawed because it relies on this very sort of, um, again, binary or dualistic understanding of the visual, like there's darkness and there's light, or there's visibility and there's invisibility. And in fact, I think um, those two categories kind of influence each other um, or uh, kind of bleed into one another in ways that we don't always think about. And, and so ultimately, um, I don't think that simply revealing um, a harm, right, or making it visible is, is enough, right? I don't think in and of itself, it's, it may be necessary in some cases, but I don't, I don't think it's ever sufficient. And back to the specific case, mm -hmm. you said you suggest that in photographs of prisoners in Abu Ghraib, yeah. uh, the very purpose of those were to humiliate. Yes. And so the very act of illuminating these crimes is, in fact, the perpetration of the harm. Right. I argue that you know, even though we are maybe intending to do something else, right, and surely most of us are, right, when you sort of reproduce it onto a placard in a protest, for example, like you are trying to say that you don't consent to this or you don't agree with this. Um, but the history of the images, which were created for blackmail, really, they were created for entertainment, but they were also created with an eye toward using them to threaten the prisoners into um, providing information lest the pictures be released to their families or their communities. So I don't think, again, that we can ever sort of move beyond that history, that we inherit that history whenever we try to work with the pictures. Um, and I think that's true in a number of cases um, where we see images just being created, kind of forged in violence and being created not for, say, the journalistic purpose of documenting harm um, or enlightenment, but really kind of the weaponization of the camera, the weaponization of visibility. Um, and we see that more and more as a technology of warfare, which means we need to be more and more careful. Mm, fascinating. And it's complicated. Yes. It strikes me, reading the book and talking to you about uh, these ideas, that you have had to spend a very long amount of time um, thinking about terrorism, thinking about representations of uh, inhumanity, and some of the unintentionally um, 
inhumane ways these images get used. Uh, and I wonder what has it been like to make as your object of study um, a set of practices revolving around this very difficult period that you're calling the global war on terror, but really which has been life in these United States for the last uh, 13, 14 years? Well, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, in some ways, it was just a matter of happenstance, right? That um, just as I was sort of becoming a researcher in graduate school, that time sort of mapped onto the intensification of the global war on terror. So in many ways, just as a person who was looking around, it seemed like a natural, a natural thing to do. Um, but at the same time, um, I'm also very aware, and I try to talk about this a little bit in the book, I'm also very aware that as a scholar, I occupy a privileged position. I, I'm not in the military. I'm not from a military family. I know I know directly or closely very few people who are actually fighting this war. So I try to sort of think through in the book um, what my role in it is. And I've been very concerned, and again, I don't think there's a perfect solution for it. I've been very concerned about the problematics of trying to make a career for myself um, researching these things that's all about human suffering. So many of the images that I talk about are people on the worst day of their lives, right? the unimaginably worst day of their lives. So what I try to do in the book is think about or maybe model, um, if, that's not too, if that's not too grandiose, model a way of doing, doing research that's, I think, more um, responsive to those ethical complexities and more attentive to the material reality. Um, I, I mean, you know, th theory is only so good, right, as it, only as good as its application. Um, and so much of what we're talking about here has very sort of real and daily and concrete implications. So I'm trying to think about how we might um, research it uh, in a new way. Great. And lest uh, anyone think that this book is 250 pages of describing and problematizing the representations of torture, it's not. It w ranges, again, across a wide uh, circuit of visual practices, including um, uh, uh, what you call the dimensional uh, uh, aspect of visual practices. And in that chapter, which is chapter two, I believe, you uh, explore a very interesting cultural practice, which, again, I learned about from reading your book, uh, called the flat daddy. Could you tell us a little bit about what flat daddies are and how they became uh, another critical visual artifact in, in documenting this, this period of time in America? Sure. Um, flat daddies are basically not quite life-size. They're advertised as life-size, but what they really are is sort of oversized photographic cutouts of deployed um, military service personnel um, who are then, so the photographs are then kind of sent back to the families who are basically um, encouraged to integrate the photographs into Sort of like a card life. stock, like a cardboard cutout sort of? Well, yeah. I mean, they're actually printed um, when, they, when they're produced, they're printed kind of just on a sheet of glossy photographic paper, but families are then encouraged to mount them on like foam core, okay. something that's really durable, and then cut out around the edges. So you have basically the silhouette um, of your deployed um, in most cases, but not all cases, it's a father, right? Hence flat daddies. There are flat mommies. Um, and the idea is that you will take this, um, this photograph, this large photograph of your absent loved one, um, and basically integrate it into everyday life. So flat daddy goes to the soccer game, flat daddy goes on family vacation, flat daddy plays baseball, flat daddy gets a portion of dinner, um, and, and that's the idea of the project. It begins, um, I want to say maybe about 2004, there was a National Guard unit in Maine that began providing them for their families. And one of the peculiarities of this conflict has been its reliance on um, National Guard and reserve troops. Um, and this is Im important and significant because these generally are military families that were never sort of expecting long overseas deployments. So they were never quite prepared for, you know, they were less prepared for it and they also have less 
institutional support. So unlike military families that live on bases or in other kind of military communities, uh, families in the Guard or families in the Reserve are, tend to be very scattered and isolated. So um, this main National Guard unit seemed to think that one solution for this was to create these photographs, right, mm. to take the place of the deployed service member. Um, they caught on really fast, um, and they were all being produced by this company in Toledo, Ohio, SFC Graphics. Um, for a time, SFC was simply providing flat daddies to any family that wanted them, um, but that got cost prohibitive, so now people have to pay, and they're between $40 and $50 with shipping. Um, but there's still a pretty, um, a surprisingly, I think, uh, widespread part of this of this visual culture. Um, when people do talk about them, they haven't gotten a whole lot of media attention. But when people do talk about them, um, they tend to be tend to talk about them in these very dismissive or derogatory ways. Um, always through the narrative of oh, these poor military families are being duped by the state, um, or this kind of condescension like oh, they must be so upset that they have to talk to a picture. Um, and in fact, I argue that when you actually work with the testimonials. Of of these military families who use them, um, it's much more complicated than that. Um, and that these, these photographs do serve an important function. Um, people derive a lot of pleasure from them. They derive a lot of comfort from them. Um, I mean, it's not all quite that rosy, but I think it is a different kind of, um, a different a different feel from from many of the other case studies in the book. And I argue that it's important for, they're important for scholars because they, they represent a really unique way of using the photograph. We mm. often use photographs um, to represent people who aren't there, right? Like we keep a photograph of someone who we don't see often. We want to look at their picture. Um, we talk about photographs in terms of absence. But I argue that flat daddies actually are really about presence and really about kind of seamlessly integrating um, the photograph into into daily life, and I think that's actually profoundly important for the families that do it. So um, I wanted to both sort of draw some attention to that practice, um, draw attention to the potentials of it, and, and think about a different way of understanding it to sort of move beyond the dismissal or the trivializing. Um, yeah. and, and you suggest that this is, a, a, a if not unique, then a, a, a practice without a lot of precedent, that this is, can you think of uh, other uh, historical precedents in which ph photographs have operated in the ways that you've found uh, the flat daddies operating in the testimonials? I really can't. Um, I mean, I think there is a long history of photography being associated with military deployment or other imaging technologies, particularly going back to the Civil War, right, when we had um, very sort of proto-photographs sort of proto photographs, um, being produced. So we have lots and lots of things from the era of the Civil War of men in uniform being photographed before um, going to the front. Before that, there were, there were sort of painting equivalents of that, um, miniatures that people could keep as sort of mementos. But um, I think really in the history of photography, um, particularly the history of wartime photography, this is pretty, this is pretty distinctive. Um, for the most part, we often see photography uh, during war being associated with mourning, right? So you take the picture, um, you hold on to the picture after the person has been killed in battle, or you hold on to it during the long um, long deployment, and these don't seem to be functioning in quite that same way. Um, there really is no no indication that we're sort of using the people are using the flat daddies um, in the event that somebody dies or something like that. It really is about maintaining presence in the family life as opposed to marking an absence, which I think is is a pretty significant departure from previous photographic practices. If you have an example, I'd love to hear it. Um, but I think that you know, at least from from what I found. It's it's pretty distinct. It does seem like the criticisms that you uh, that you mention uh, come from a kind of a, a sense that in which um, the families have sort of embraced a, a, a sort of a regime of hyper reality, mm -hmm. uh, as Echo or Baudrillard would call it, a, a sort of uh, uncritical trading in of the simulacrum of reality mm -hmm. for the thing it represents without what I guess the critics would hope would be some critical distance or some awareness that it is a marker rather than the actual thing it tries to mark. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, is, is that the nature of the criticisms uh, that, that you have encountered? Oh, absolutely. I mean, and that's, I think that's probably the tamest criticisms. Mm -hmm. There's some of them um, that can be rather, um, I guess, crass or prurient mm -hmm. um, because flat daddies, for example, are only imaged from the waist right. up. There's people that talk about how, like, this is good practice for when, oh. um, you're, when your father comes home missing his legs. Oh, um, there's some people who have talked about, you know, sort of made sort of obscene jokes about right. the relationships between like the parent and right. the flat daddy right. um, and I think all of that is really just kind of is so far wide of the mark um, you know as you read the testimonials of the flat daddy families they all know right they all know what they're doing um, but what's so interesting to me is what I think about is this kind of loving suspension of disbelief mm -hmm. right the importance of the practice of maintaining closeness mm -hmm. um, to this person who's far away right. um, I argue that flat daddies actually provide a way for better or worse um, for military families to kind of manage their anger at the yes. state which is something that you know military families can't ever articulate publicly, right? There could be significant reper repercussions if um, a, a military wife, for example, complained publicly about, you know, the stresses of managing a household alone or the very limited resources and, and support that the government provides despite all the promises of, of what they'll do for military families. And so I think that the flats kind of provide a way for them to manage it and a place to put it. Um, and I think that's, that's really important. Again, it's not perfect, but um, I, I think I'm, I'm really interested mm. in the kind of work it takes to maintain these relationships, which mm. is intensely creative, right. um, and it's intensely difficult, right? And, and we think about the mother who has to kind of sustain this right. for her child. Um, interestingly, in a lot of the testimonials, people talk about actually preferring the flat daddies to things like Skype, which we'd think would be so much better. Right, but right. it's something about having this photograph, having something that you can touch, having something that you can kind of cart around with you and snuggle up with if you want, um, that really sort of adds adds an extra dimension. That's it's incredibly fascinating, um, and so you your uh, your book also looks at juridical uh, practices within uh, visual culture. Uh, in the in the final chapter, you look at the case of. Uh, Adam Gadan, yes. who, who is a, a really interesting case, and I think less well known by uh, many uh, uh, Americans who who did follow a lot mm -hmm. of the a lot of the news coming out in the 2000s uh, around John Walker Lind, mm -hmm. who was dubbed the American Taliban. Uh, Adam Gadan is an American citizen who is arrested, and as you say, he's the first American charged with treason since the World War II era, yes. which is just a fascinating. Uh, a fascinating uh, development. So tell us a little bit about what what's going on with uh, Adam Gadan. Well, Adam Gadan is, as you said, the first American to be charged with treason since the era of World War II. And it's a particularly interesting case because he's never actually fought for the enemy. So unlike someone like John Walker Lind, who was actually picked up fighting for the other side, um, who was actually not charged with treason. And interestingly, um, many sort of political theorists have argued that um, the government sort of created whole new categories of crimes to avoid charging this guy with treason. Um, in the case of Adam Gadan, um, they actually invoke this charge of treason, which has been legally dormant for 60 years. Um, it's interesting for my purposes because he's never fought for the enemy, but what he did was go make movies for them. So he's from the west coast of the U.S., California, Oregon, both of those places. Um, in the early 2000s, he decamps for Pakistan, um, loses contact with his family around 2001, 2002, hasn't been contacted since, really, except for his appearance in these propaganda videos for al-Qaeda. Um, and so it's interesting to me that this is the crime, right, or this is the transgression that gets marked as treason. Um, there's no evidence that he's ever fought for the enemy. Um, there's some hint that he may have attended like an al-Qaeda training camp, um, but interestingly in the indictment that's never mentioned, right? The indictment is entirely about his movie making activities. Um, even more interesting is the fact that his movies are rather boring. Um, periodically he'll make a threat about the streets of America running red with blood or something like that, but for the most part he kind of sounds like any other critic of the war. Um, he's often filmed uh, in like an office setting with books behind him or a computer. Um, there's one or two videos where he's holding a gun sort of 
help, you know, not not in any sort of menacing way. He's just sort of propped up next to him. Um, but for the most part, they're they're pretty tame. There's very few specific threats. Um, and yet this is the man that they've charged with the capital crime of so, treason. So that, that confuses me because here we seem to fall into um, a more traditional notion of how we, I, I might mm -hmm. have thought before I read your book, how I might have thought about the visual culture, cultural mm -hmm. practices in the war on terror, which is you have a state which is overreacting or mm -hmm. um, thin-skinned about potentially uh, subversive or undermining uh, visual artifacts like a film, a mm -hmm. propaganda film, and then would sort of overreach in its attempt to quash it. But if, as you say, these movies are made um, that are not terribly compelling, uh, w what, how does he represent such a threat that they would dust off this category of, of a traitor uh, to, 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 try to, to try to contain him? Well, one of the things um, that's important to know about the category of treason is that um, it's sort of notoriously difficult to prosecute um, because the evidentiary standards are really high, and it's it's tough to prove an intent to be disloyal. Mm. Um, the other challenge with treason is that governments tend to be very skittish about invoking this idea because it's a way of confessing a sort of imperfectness in national loyalty. So if you're like, this guy was raised in California, um, and some sort of mysterious thing happens um, and all of a sudden he's making movies um, for al-Qaeda he's hiding out in Pakistan um, he became briefly famous after the raid on Osama bin Laden's compound there was some correspondence between them where um, Adam Gadan was sort of posing himself as like a media strategist for Osama bin Laden um, if you can say that these sorts of if you confess that these kinds of things can happen the whole idea of national loyalty starts to look a little bit flimsy um, so it's always a risk to call somebody a traitor, but I suggest that um, the threat posed by the image of Adam Gadan was so great that they had to do it. They had no other choice um, because all of the other sort of categories that were available to them didn't work, right? So if they called him a terrorist, right, he's also an American. So then all of a sudden you have Americans who can be terrorists, you have Americans who can fall in with Al-Qaeda, and so there are all sorts of things that they had to kind of manage um, and I argue that the category of traitor worked best. There's also um, people... So no good answers. No good answers. Like, like, uh, like American scholars, uh, the federal government is presented with a series of not perfect choices. Yeah, and in fact, um, when the indictment was announced, um, some people argued that it was basically an effort for the Bush administration at the time to sort of show that it was like really on the job. But of course, um, at the time, we were still... Six or six or so years away from catching Osama bin Laden, so it was a public relations risk at the time because you have this man who was briefly named the most wanted terrorist for like a minute. He replaced Osama bin Laden at the top of that list, um, but nobody's ever caught him. Nobody's ever seen him. He's still at large. He's still at large. There were some rumors in like 2008 that he had been killed in a drone strike, um, but in fact, what was interesting is that after. Um, those rumors started to circulate on the internet and in some of the kind of terrorist monitoring blogs, um, the government actually worked really hard to refute those rumors, to say that he was still out there. Mm. Um, and so I argue in the book that what they want actually is to kind of capture him alive so that they can sort of control his image and actively disappear him, right, to kind of respond to a visual transgression with this kind of visual punishment. So it's not like... Um, someone like Alaki who they wanted to kill, right, who they sought to kill, I argue that they actually want him caught alive, right, so that they can um, sort of manage his image a little bit differently. Because if yeah. you just kill somebody in a drone strike, that's not actually all that spectacular, right? You, right. There's no footage of that. Right. Um, and so I argue that for, for someone like Gadan, they need they need the sort of visual victory of capturing him. And in fact, they've been very reluctant um, to concede the possibility that he's dead. Um, as far as I know, he's still around. He's still making movies. He became very active um, around the time of the Arab Spring. Um, and he released sort of like a, a mini series. Um, so he's, he's still around. Um, he hasn't gotten as much attention uh, lately, but we have no indication that, that he's been dead. And I suspect that um, that that's okay with the people who've charged him. Wow, very fascinating. Um, it does sound like uh, you have really explored uh, the visual practices related to the global war on terror in fascinating ways. 
Uh, and uh, I, I do think that while um, many of the actors in, in these situations, uh, as you say, find themselves faced with no good choices, um, you have a good choice, which is to make sure to purchase this book and read it at your earliest opportunity. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Rebecca Edelman from UMBC. Thank you.